Hello everybody, this is Grandmaster Brian Smith with ChessLecture.com. I will be starting a series on Rook and Pawn endings uh, with this uh, video. Of course, uh, you probably know Rook and Pawn endings are some of the hardest uh, endings to play in chess, and they have their own rules to a certain extent. Uh, so it's important to use these rules. Well, some rules from the majority of chess positions may apply. Uh, distant pass pawns are good in the ending, central control, activity of pieces, but the rook and pawn endings have their own special rules and a lot of concrete calculation. But of course, to find the moves in your calculations, you need to understand the principles of these endings, and we'll be looking at some of them. So here, first of all, is uh, I think a really beautiful and instructive example from uh, the former world champion Vasily Smyslov, against Paul Benko from the Solnok 1975 tournament. And this, uh, this ending has a kind of theme which you can find in some rook and pawn endings where the pawns slowly become eliminated and, but uh, the advantage remains. And I think this is kind of beautiful, um, this, uh, this scenario. And we'll, we'll be seeing that how as the position simplifies, white continuously maintains his advantage despite not having a material advantage really at any point in the game. Uh, so we'll, we'll be looking at that. So to start off with, uh, first uh, the rooks were traded and then obvious move king d4 was played and black activated his rook with rook to c8. So if we look at this position, material is equal, but uh, pretty much any chess player can see that white has the advantage. Uh, first of all, the better king position and this is important here, this gives white more space and constantly black will have to watch for chances for white's king to invade. And since it's white's move, he can take over the open file, the E file. Furthermore, his pawns give him a space advantage. This pawn on H5 uh, holds back two of black's pawns and in general can be a threat. As we'll see long past this position, it will constantly be a threat and this pawn can be weak. And another factor is while white doesn't technically have a queenside majority, he has the very good chances of creating a pass pawn there, and we'll see how that might be done as well. Uh, for your information, the rest of the game will be in the PGN. Uh, you can look at it there. I'm, it's not part of the subject matter for the video, but uh, it's also an instructive example of maintaining uh, an advantage in the hedgehog of slowly constricting the opponent. Um, so that you can check out if you like. So now it's Black's move, and he doesn't want to just wait. Uh, there are many plans for White if Black just waits. The pressure can slowly build. There are ideas with lifting White's rook up and attacking there. There's chances to to push on the queen side. Uh, Black can fall into Zugzwang, where he has to allow c5, and and in some cases with uh, White's following up with a rook invading on the b file, and then coming into b6 or or possibly invading on the e file after the king black king has to move away so this is kind of a threat c5 if black's rook moves away um, so black looked for counterplay and he played g6 which was a natural attempt to um, break white space advantage on the king side but i think this was um, i think this was a mistake and i think the better chances were offered although white has still has an advantage after, with a5. I think this move uh, gives uh, black some good ch reasonable chances to hold the game and I didn't try to find a forced win for white which is not really possible or whether black can can successfully hold but basically I looked at b takes a5, b takes a5, rook b1 which is natural. White hopes to come to b5 or maybe to b6 in some cases and then black can occupy the uh, the uh, open file with rook to e8. Note if white tried to do two things, rook e5, keep the uh, e file while also attacking a5, but now here black has rook takes c4, and then black wins because he's going to be faster. Rather, the white king will be shut out, and then the d-pawn runs. So rook to b1 would be the natural move. Otherwise, black would play rook b8 and rook b4, something like that. And then rook e8, so black can look for some counterplay. 
with the idea of rook e2. So I think rook b5, rook e2, and black is uh, in fine shape. I don't think white's going to win there. His kingside pawns are too weak, and white's rook will be awkwardly placed after taking on a5 in front of the passed pawn, which, of course, is one of the crucial rules that are in rook and pawn endings, that you want your rook behind a passed pawn, not in front of it. So white would stop rook e2, probably with king to d3, but this gives black a chance now to play rook e5 and attack h5. And what's going to happen from here, it's, well, white can play moves like maybe g4, and definitely keeps the advantage. In general, let's say, for instance, after rook b5, black can't take this pawn because white have, will have a protected pass pawn, and this will um, keep black uh, occupied to eventually white will manage to attack the d7 pawn, and I think this king and pawn ending appears to be lost, but black has rook g5, so probably that's not the uh, best. Maybe some move like um, like uh, g4 protecting the pawn, and white's keeping the advantage, but it seems like black has counterplay here, various uh, possibilities. Still, white's base advantage might carry the day, but... Uh, can't go completely into figuring out whether white can win or not, but I think that a5 was better chance. So instead, Benko played g6, and now came a very nice move. Uh, white doesn't want to trade off the uh, pawn. I mean, maybe he keeps advantage after f takes g6, h takes, g, uh, h takes g6, f takes g6, and then something like f4, but uh, it's, it's not so easy. So what uh, Smyslov did was played rook h1. So he wants to, first uh, he threatens h takes g6 and forces g5 since uh, rook to h8 would just be too passive here. Black's rook uh, stuck and no moves and eventually his king will have to give way. I mean, you can repeat back and forth, but white has various ways to make progress, pushing the pawns on the king side or playing c5 and then hitting the king toward f6. So this is... Uh, not really playable, and same with even worse is g takes h5, rook takes h5, and now the pawn is under attack, and it, a defense like rook h8 is not something you can really consider here. For instance, white can start with a5, which is, we're going to be seeing a, a key theme here. Um, to this this pawn thrust when it's supported by the rook, uh, and black is lost here. So, g5 was played, and now White's returned with the rook to, to the open file, having ensured uh, the, the existence of the h5 pawn, which is going to be a constant threat for black. Now h6 is weak, so black no longer has a chance here really to play a5 as before, because after here, after b takes a5, b takes a5, rook to b1, and now there's rook to b6. For instance, after rook e8, there's rook to b6, and white takes the pawn on h6 and is winning. So then, otherwise, rook will come to b5, and black will be lost here. I mean, a defense, again, totally passive by, say, for instance, king c6, rook b5, rook a8, is not really possible in here. White would just head down to, oops, down to g7 and attack the h-pawn. So black played uh, g4, which was a good try. After f5 simply f3, and black is going to eventually run out of moves. Uh, for instance, uh, if he play, well, I mean, if his rook comes up to c7, then rook to e8, and white invades this way, and then comes rook h8. Uh, so, if, uh, again, of course, a5 doesn't work for the same reasons as before, and if a move like rook to f8, uh, then, uh, then white can play c5, bc5, bc5, king c7, rook to e7, and uh, rook is invading and, and comes to h7, and uh, white will attack the king's side pawns. The rook from f6 can be attacked by king e5, so this doesn't, uh, doesn't help. So in order to avoid falling into Zugzwang, he had to play g4. And now white played rook to a1, now we're seeing that his plan is to play a5. It's worth considering uh, still playing just waiting with rook to e2, um, followed by rook to e1, etc. 
Here may be a little bit different that uh, black can push, uh, when the rook is on f8, push f4 and trade off pawns this way. And then, so for instance, f5, if white continues to wait, then um, rook to f8. And then if white plays the same way, perhaps uh, this uh, gives black some counterplay now. It's going to take and come rook f3. So, so white changed his plan and played rook a1, intending to play a5, which is positionally an excellent blow here. You, even, you want this move in the middle game, this type of move you need to look for in this structure. Because whichever way the pawn tension is, is uh, removed, black's a6 pawn will become weak. And also, as we'll see, there's a tactical idea once the pawn gets to a5. If black takes, the rook takes, and a6 is under attack. If black pushes b5, white gets a passed, uh, protected past pawn. So it's, uh, it's very positionally desirable to play a5. So now black needed to anticipate this move. And as we saw yet again, uh, a5 doesn't work because of the same reasons. Rook to b1 and rook to b6 or rook to b5 are coming. Black has no counterplay because rook to b6 will capture the h6 pawn, which will be too much then. So, meanwhile, if black uh, just, um, uh, for instance, plays rook to e8, then comes a5, and uh, black, is, uh, black is not getting any counterplay, and uh, white is about to take on b6, and, and, uh, and so on. So, meanwhile, if black tries to just wait and keep his king on d6, and play something like this to prepare to take back with the rook, then of course uh, there's this fork coming, so he can't do that. So basically he has to move his king in order to avoid that, in order to protect b6 with the rook. So he played king c7. And now after a5, rook to b8. Again, uh, if rook to e8, then um, white's, uh, white can... Um, Play, I believe, a takes b6, king takes b6, c5 check, king to b7, and probably just rook a2 here, and white, uh, uh, white is advancing the king to d5, and uh, can um, continue to attack, uh, aim for attacks on a6, h6, g4. I believe this is uh, the, the point. I'm not sure here whether uh, white can also just uh, play, for instance, rook a2. But I think, so, yeah, as we take on b6 and then and then uh, c5 check has to go to b7 and just stop uh, rook e2 with uh, rook a2. And black can keep rook on e6, but um, king d5 and black is, black is in trouble here. I think that's, uh, um, that white should... White should win. There's also ideas of rook d2, rook d4 to attack the uh, the g-pawn and bring the rook to f4 where it both defends f2 and attacks f7. So I think that this uh, this is not working for black. Notice that whenever the rook goes to f6, white can play king e5 and chase it away with the king then invading either on the king side on f5 or on d6. And the black king can't leave the a-pawn. In fact, it can't even move, so black can fall in Zugzwang because b5 if the king goes to a7. So it appears to be winning for white. So he protected with a rook. Um, and now he hopes, you know, after white takes, then rook takes, and now b4 is under attack, which constrains white. Uh, but now came a very nice and thematic idea here, which uh, you should be aware of. Well, white has this pawn tension, and as we saw, there was no queenside majority, but this kind of pawn structure can produce a passed pawn, and Smyslov did that by playing b5. So white is, well, even in, in a king and pawn ending, white can, you know, take the rooks off the board and the kings are somewhere else, and white wins by creating a passed pawn in this way, by the pawn tension. Here, with rooks on the board, white just creates a distant passed pawn, but this distant passed pawn provides the, the winning edge for white. So a takes b5, and yeah, if your kings were far away and there were no rooks, then white would play a6 and queen the pawn. 
But here, that doesn't work. If a6, b takes c4, and black can stop the pawn while mm, keeping his rook, you know, stop the pawn with the king, even attack the pawn on a6. So that doesn't win, but white just takes back instead. It's going to have a pass b pawn. Uh, so black took on uh, a5, otherwise it would come a6. Rook takes a5. Uh, and now rook to b6. So black uh, blockades the pawn and prepares maybe to play uh, rook to uh, rook to f6 or something like that. If instead black played king to b6, then would come rook a6 check. King takes b5 and rook takes h6. And white's, uh, white's going to win here. Uh, the pawn on h5 is too strong and the, the, other, the remaining pawns are weak. So white will be able to attack F, uh, either f7 or maybe go to f5 and attack g4 long before black's d-pawn goes anywhere. Also white can even come up and attack the d-pawn as well. Rook h7 attacking f7, so black is lost there. So he played rook to b6. And now rook a7 check, and black had to retreat to the back rank to c8 because of king to d6, rook a6. And we see that this outside pass pawn is a major advantage uh, in many ways, but in one of them is that uh, in king and pawn ending, white usually wins because of this pawn, which means that black can, can never trade rooks. Here we see an example of how this inability to trade rooks constrains black. Of course, uh, if black trades, I mean, black, if black plays this way and if he takes, then the outside pass pawn is going to mean that white, uh, uh, white will, um, mm, white will uh, uh, gain the, uh, you know, for for instance, this way, and white will, uh, white will get be closer to the king side after the pawns are traded and win the game. So. So the rook trade is impossible, and it's the same thing after king c7, white will trade, and then eventually trade b5 for d7 and take the and reach the king side first. So black had to retreat, king c8. You see that still material is equal, but still white's space advantage and his structural advantage has persisted despite the uh, the trade of some pawns. The pass pawn the the the, the, the uh, pseudo majority on the queen side resulted in the pass pawn, which is keeping black busy. The h5 pawn is still providing a space advantage on the king side. Uh, so here now white continued with king to c5, and uh, king advances to gain, uh, and white gains some more space. Rook to f6, black attacks f2. So there's going to be some more trades. G4 is going to fall off, and F2 is going to fall off. Of course, when Black played G4 a while ago, he was making that pawn weak, but he was also, well, the circumstances sort of required him to do that. Um, but also, he's making White's F2 pawn weak as well. So those pawns are going to be traded now. So White played Rook A4. Black played uh, Rook takes F2. If instead Black tried to first bring the king up to c7 um, to prevent white from later advancing the king, then white would have rook f4 here. And as before, black can't trade rooks uh, because white's going to just um, take uh, the d-pawn in exchange while well, black's taking the b-pawn and then go after f7 and queen the, his own f-pawn. So black would have to play after rook f4, rook e6. Uh, and then white's, uh, white plays king to d4 uh, to stop rook e5 check. We don't want to give up that crucial pawn, so king to d4. And now two black pawns are under attack. Of course, white wants to take the uh, f7 pawn because his rook will remain in contact with f2. Black trip plays f6 to protect, protect this pawn, then rook takes g4, rook e5. And finally, white can trade off the h pawn with rook g6 reaching this position. Rook takes b5, h5, rook f6, rook b5, rook h6. And this uh, this ending is winning for white. Uh, the two passed pawns will defeat the one on d7. Um, not going to go into details here, but this is standard 
and it shouldn't be too hard either. So um, black uh, immediately took on f2, and white took on uh, g4. So yet another pair of pawns has been traded, but white's, and it's still equal pawns, but white's pers positional advantage persists. Uh, the, the advantage of the king position, the outside pass pawn, the weakness of h6, and white's h5, dangerous h5 pawn, uh, all are still there. Black's f7 pawn can become weak. So we'll now see how Smyslov continued to guide the game toward victory, although there's a little glitch at the end which is real interesting and instructive. We'll see that. Uh, so now black played king to c7. If, if, uh, if instead rook f5, uh, king to b6, and uh, white is winning here, threat is checkmate on g8. So uh, if black pushes the d-pawn, then king, um, then, uh, king to a7, uh, followed by advancing a pawn. So instead black uh, played king c7. Uh, Pose the white king. Now b6 check. White makes uh, pushes the black king away. King to b7. Rook f4. So white uh, has uh, managed to um, has managed to uh, gain this good spot for the rook where he attacks f7. Rook to c2 check. King to d6. So generally the idea is white's going to give up the b7, b6 pawn, but it diverts the black pieces, and that's what's happening. So black now took on b6 with the king. He could also try uh, rook to d2 first in order to keep the d7 pawn, but after king to e7, king takes b6, king takes f7, uh, white still wins thanks to this still this long ago established positional advantage. So for instance, d5, king g6, black can't protect the h6 pawn, d4, king takes h6, d3, g4, and white wins easily. Uh, black's rook is badly placed, and white will simply get behind the pawn and then push on the king side. If it came down to it, white could give up his rook for the pawn and still win with two pawns far advanced on the king side. So this didn't work for black. So he took on b6, uh, white took on d7, has to eliminate this pawn, and uh, black played rook h2. It's still, despite all those trades, white's basic positional advantage persists. The black king is far away, the white rook is better placed, the white king is better placed, and the black pawns are weaker. So black is actually in a desperate situation now. And he tried a clever idea with rook h2 here. Uh, some other move, for instance, rook e2 trying to bar the white king's way. Um, one way white can win is, uh, I guess, just to take f7. And then we're about to come back and take h6, put the rook on g6 and, you know, win that way. So this is, uh, black is basically has to... Uh, has to try to find something here, and he played rook h2, g4, and now rook h4. So the idea is that if white just plays king e7, black can play f5 and uh, force these the trade of pawns. I'm not sure, maybe even white wins here with rook f6 check, followed by rook to g6, and uh, I'm not so sure. It's, uh, we'll be looking at these rook and versus... Um, rook versus rook and pawn endings in a bit. Uh, but more simple was uh, what uh, Smyslov played, rook f6, check, uh, and king c5 black played. So this f5 has been prevented. And here, first little inaccuracy. It looks like position sh should be pretty easy win. I mean, white can come and take these pawns, and it all comes down to the tempos, of course. Uh, some rook and pawn versus rook with an h-pawn are drawn, even with the white king uh, up by the pawn and the black king away, because whites can be st white can be stuck in front of the pawn. So white has to be accurate here. And I think here the simplest way is, well, can be basically found by uh, general principles, is that white needs the king, of course. 
So we play the most useful move first, and uh, that's, uh, that's king e7. Of course white needs to bring the king to the king side. So we can decide later how we're going to take h6 by the king or by the rook, maybe depending on what black does. Also white uh, takes the f7 pawn, which is going to be necessary. So rook takes g4, king takes f7, uh, king to d5, rook takes h6. I mean, king to d5, I don't know what else black can play. The key is white is cutting him off on the 6th rank. Rook takes h6. Let's say king e5. Rook to g6. And this is winning position. This is a winning position for white. So, for instance, if black plays rook h4, just h6. King e f5, king g7, and white uh, easily wins. Uh, if black tries to shift the rook, uh, then uh, h7 is one way. Rook h, uh, rook a7 check, king h6, and if rook h, rook a8, then rook g8, and so on, and white wins. For instance, rook a6, um, white can play, uh, uh, king h5, rook a1, then just uh, rook f8 check, followed by by uh, h8 queen, not of course allowing, n not of course getting excited and queening the pawn because then black would have checkmate, but we first give the check and, you know, then, then white wins. So, and if, meanwhile, if uh, um, after rook g6, if black plays rook a4, trying to transfer to this side, then white only has one move that wins, actually, it turns out. Uh, I believe h6 black... Uh, um, black begins by checking and king f5 and starts giving checks on the on the back rank on the last seventh uh, seventh and eighth ranks. But uh, instead, after um, rook a4, white has rook f6. First of all, cutting the king off a little bit more and making room for the white king on g6. And now white wins if, if rook a7, king g6, and then white's playing h7, or h6, h7, uh, soon enough. While if uh, black shifts back to the h file, then h6, uh, and black can't do anything if rook h1, king g7, and white plays h7, h7 next, rook g6, he can block the check and wins. So this was fairly straightforward, at least more than what could have happened, what should have happened in the game. And it's logical to play king e7 because you, in any case, regardless of um, what happens, the white king will have to go towards the king side. So that's the most flexible move. But uh, Smyslov played rook takes h6, which is also natural. Of course, white has to take this h pawn, but there may be some, some subtleties here. And we'll, we'll be seeing that. So now uh, black took on g4, and here Smyslov made a serious mistake, which it's not easy to see, um, and I don't think anyone saw this. Um, but of course, by this point, we have table bases, and so this type of position has been analyzed by computers to a 100% known conclusion. Um, and... Uh, what Smyslov played was rook f6, and I'll show you why this was a mistake here first before going back uh, to to what he should have played. So here, Pen Penko basically gave up with rook e4, and after white started pushing the h-pawn, the game was quickly over. Uh, what he could have played, however, was very interesting and instructive rook to g7, which of course the players saw h6, rook h7, king e7, and okay, I mean, Smyslov and Benko probably just thought the king is coming to g8, and the rook will be trapped, which is, they calculated, of course, king to d5, king f8, king e5, king g8, and white wins, because if the king takes f7, king takes h7, and black wishes his f7 pawn weren't there. Um, so white, white uh, queens the pawn since black can't play king f7. However, there's a really nice subtlety here. 
Instead of the obvious king e5, black has a brilliant move king e4. And this forces a draw immediately. And probably a good player can find this if you have the position on the board, but it's, uh, it's not easy to, you know, under pressure and see who knows the time situation. And also it looks hopeless with the rook on g on h7 and you, you just look at king e5 and you give it up. But this move now would draw the game. The idea is, of course, if white does nothing, black and white has no moves that, that really do nothing. The rook moves, then f5 comes, uh, or, or black takes h6. Obviously, this is a draw. Um, so king to g8 is the obvious move. And now black plays rook takes h6. Rook takes h6, f5. And this was the point of king e4. Uh, black now draws. Uh, white, white's rook is just on the wrong side of the board, and the king is just too far away. So, for instance, um, after if white, the natural king f7, heading toward the pawn, then f4, king e6, f3, and uh, now it's uh, it's a draw. For instance, rook h4, king e3, king e5, f2, and drawn, rook h1, king e2, and so the next uh, pawn is uh, black has to, or white has to give up the rook for the pawn. So another try would be if white wants to switch the rook to the long side, which is really where you want it, to the side with the black king. Still it's not enough. After f4, king g7, f3, king g6, king e3, king g5, f2, rook a1, king e2, and it's a, it's a draw. So after f5, the game is a draw, and here, of course, white can do nothing else. Uh, so this would force the draw. Uh, of course, if white plays something else, like king e7, then black can just play rook h7, and white has to reach the same position after h6. So now going back um, to this crucial point, it was still possible for white to win, um, but he had to be very careful here. So the right move was actually king e7 uh, with the intention of getting to the same rook and pawn ending we just saw which is what would happen if black just plays king d5, king g6, and then we're ha we'll have the same position as, as before. Uh, so let's try f5 for black and see what happens there. So king f6, okay, f4, king f5, rook h4. Um, the other possibility is rook g2, just giving up the pawn, but after king takes f4, king d5, rook f6, uh, white is winning here. Uh, he threatens to push the h pawn, and the king has uh, the black king is cut off far enough on the file and far enough on the rank that white wins. So, rook uh, f2, king g5 doesn't change anything. Black can't trade rooks, and if he um, plays this way, then then this uh, um, then this is uh, this is a win. For instance, king e5, h6, and similar to the, what we already have seen. Next comes uh, h7, or if the, the rook moves away, king to g7, and then white can interpose with either rook move and soon queen the pawn. So let's try instead rook h4. Then comes king g5, uh, rook h2. Rook h1 is not really any different. King takes f4. And here, if black play this this line really depends on some really subtle tactics, actually. So here, for instance, if king to d5, white has rook a6, which is critical gain of time. Uh, black can't take the pawn because of the skewer. So white gets to play h6, and the black king remains cut off enough for white to win. So instead, king to d4, trying to come closer while avoiding that, not letting white's rook out from in front of the pawn. Black intends to check and then bring the king closer, and then check again, and reach a drawn position. So in order to win, white has to use this nice maneuver to gain a tempo. Check on d6, 
Okay, if black just goes king c4, then h6 is, is winning. So king to c5. Now rook a6, as before, but with a, um, but with a king on c5. So black has to play king b5, otherwise, well, of course, he can't take again. And if, if he doesn't, then white is playing h6, so he plays king b5. Now the rook has to go back to h6. Black plays king c5, and we see that white has gained a tempo. It's now his move, and before the black king was on d4. So this unusual tempo gain maneuver is, is uh, useful to know. Uh, so now king to g5. And white intends, to, uh, intends again to just cut the king off with rook f, uh, with, uh, rook f6, or, or rook e6. Uh, so now rook to g2, for instance. King f6. And black can try king d6, but then comes king f7. And next, rook g6. So king e5, or king d7, rook g6. And then, for instance, if, if king e5, rook, a, uh, rook g6, rook h2, h6, king f5, king g7, and white reaches position he wants, uh, which is winning, that we've seen before. Um, same with king d7, rook to g6. Let's suppose check on f2. White can play rook f6, rook h2, h6, and black is still not uh, uh, reaching any anywhere. So rook h1, king to g7, uh, king to e7, rook to g6, and white just pushes the pass pawn yeah. and wins. So instead, if black keeps checking, um, instead of trying to bring the king closer and plays rook to f2 check, then comes king to g7. And further checks don't make any sense because rook a g6, so black plays rook h2. And still white has to be very accurate here. Black is king g6, black starts checking again, so in order to make progress, rook h8. Now the black king comes closer, king d6. But he's just not in time. h6. Um, king e7 and h7. And here, white, uh, white wins. Um, rook to g2, for instance, king h6. And if, uh, if king f7 here, white has rook f8 check. And white um, gets queen against rook, but of course the black rook is also separated from the king, and white should win quickly, in any case, theoretical win. It's the only way, I believe, here. So if instead black keeps checking, rook h2, king g6, rook g2, now the king comes to f5 and runs down to finally attack the rook, and let's say he checks one more time, and now if rook h2, then the standard maneuver rook a8 with the skewer after rook h7. So this is a long analysis, of course, but I believe white had to play something like this in order to win. So its position is more difficult than it seems, and that's one of the rules of king and pawn endings. They're never trivial. So instead, rook to f6 he played. And as we saw, black could draw by rook to g7, but instead, not believing in that, uh, Benko tried to cut off the white king with rook to e4, and now it was very straightforward. Uh, he played h6, preparing simply to push the pawn. Um, black played king to d4, trying to come closer with the king. Uh, king to d5 would, make, would be no different. Now h7, and black had to play rook h4. Rook takes f7, protecting the pawn. Uh, king e5. Black tries to approach with the king, but clearly white is just going to slip in through f8 and g8. So king e7. There's no moves for black. He just waited with rook h1, then king f8. Uh, king to e6. King to g8. And black resigns, since uh, white's going to continue with uh, rook to g7, followed by queening the pawn. So let's say black waited, rook to h2, 
Rook to g7, obviously not hurrying, but next move, queen the pawn, and black resigned uh, after after king to g8. So I think, uh, I hope you enjoyed this, uh, uh, this rook and pawn ending, despite the little blip at the end, which, uh, of course, in 1975, there were the... There were no computers that could uh, analyze this ending or table bases. Um, and there are many, I mean, okay, analysts, if they subjected the game to deep analysis, probably would have found the mistake, but uh, it's slipped uh, slipped by. Um, despite that, though, it was a beautiful game by Smyslov, and I think real instructive, as we, as we saw how he transformed this uh, standard positional advantage that even flowed, if you look at the whole PGN, from the middle game uh, in the opening into this basic rook and pawn ending, maintaining the same advantages. I think it's, uh, it's quite aesthetic. So this has been Grandmaster Brian Smith with ChessLecture.com.